Hello and welcome to yet another Mantisa Data Science webinar. My name is Imad Muhammad Khan and I organize Mantisa Data Science meetups and webinars. Uh, I will give you a little bit of an introduction on what Mantisa has been doing so far. Uh, and then I will introduce the speaker. And after that, we will have a, a fireside chat with the speaker. And then uh, hopefully towards the end, we will have some time for questions and answers. Today, uh, we have with us Shadab Khan. Thank you so much, Shadab, for taking the time to do this session with us. I'll just give a brief introduction of what Shadab has done, and uh, maybe then I will allow him to say a few words. So Shadab leads a team of applied scientists and engineers at G42 to solve problems in healthcare AI. His team develops solutions for clinical care, healthcare operations, and healthcare finance by analyzing structured and unstructured data sets ranging from electronic health records, genomics, medical imaging, and claims, among others. Before joining G42 Healthcare, Shadab was a researcher at the Inception Institute of AI in UAE, where he focused on machine learning from limited data. Shadab obtained his PhD from Dartmouth, Dartmouth College in Biomedical Engineering and did a research fellowship at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital in Radiology. I think Shadab is a great candidate for a fireside chat because he has such uh, varied experiences. And uh, I'm really excited for the session. Yeah, Shadab, if you would like to introduce yourself in a few words. Sure. Thank you so much, Imad. Thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, really happy to hear about how organically Mantisa Data Science has grown as a community. Um, really exciting to see that, you know, regardless of the locations and the community, resources such as Jeremy Howard's famous fast.ai courses are benefiting so much. I personally used it myself and found it very very useful to get started with in this uh, in this area. Um, <clears throat> so as as you already mentioned, I lead a team of applied scientists here at G42 Healthcare in Abu Dhabi. Um, G42 is a company which which is fairly new to the space. Um, we we exist we're in existence for the past three years, um, based based here in Abu Dhabi and you know looking at uh, several verticals of interests and of course healthcare among them. Where where I currently work. Cool. Okay. If, if, if you do you have more to add? Uh, no, I'm good for now. Okay. Okay. So uh, if that is the case, then uh, I'll also brief the audience on question and answers. There is a place for Q and A on the right side of your screen, perhaps, uh, where you can go and drop your questions. We can either take them during the session if uh we have time i mean during the session i mean uh, while we are having this fireside chat or towards the end of the session we will of course pick some of them up and talk uh with uh, shadab on that so yeah if you have any questions please feel free to drop them in the q a section or even the, in the chat section i will be taking a look at them during the session as well okay so with that said let's start with the first part of our chat which is the ai in healthcare and which is uh, what i was advertising everywhere because this is uh an interesting a subdomain of say AI, or rather the area in which uh, AI is being applied. Uh, and your background makes it even more interesting. You have an engineering background, but your PhD and the subsequent work uh, is in the healthcare domain. So how did this happen and uh, what inspired you to work in healthcare? Um, I think you're muted. <laughs> Has to be the most committed mistake in I started off, uh, I got interested in healthcare as a domain. Uh, I took up a research assistant position at uh, Institute for Systems and Robotics in Lisbon, Portugal, where uh, I spent a better part of six months uh, as part of my, my bachelor's thesis work mm -hmm. to work on a problem called automatic karyotyping, where the idea is you you have these chromosomes which are you know twisted and disoriented and sometimes overlapping on top of each other. And you have to essentially disentangle them and arrange them in a neat order, so you know, so the so the so the pathologists can analyze them for uh, any signatures of disease or abnormality, so to speak. And that was broadly speaking a medical image analysis problem, um, and that was that was what really sparked my interest in not just image analysis but specifically medical image analysis because. Working in healthcare, it's hard not to feel the importance of the problems you're working on. You, you know, as cliched as it might sound, um, it it really is a very satisfying domain to be working on. Um, 
and particularly for those reasons i started looking at uh, phd positions in, in in medical image analysis or uh, and related areas luckily i got an admit from from dartmouth to work with uh, ryan halter on developing a medical imaging device which was uh, which was again um, focused on analyzing signatures of bio impedance as a biomarker um, to to identify whether there is a signature of cancer in the imaging domain or not and that was really interesting because you you often get to work with images uh, that that are coming from a medical imaging scanner um, but this was really a rather you know at, at least to me it sounded like a very unique opportunity to work on building the medical imaging device itself and that was very exciting so I actually got involved as an electrical engineer in fact my phd was focused on medical imaging device development more than the analysis of images themselves and uh, you know so from the, from uh, from there on i was uh, towards the end of my phd i explored the you know the 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 interest area that got me to dartmouth in the first place the image analysis side and i i thought i wanted to explore that a bit more so i you know started looking for post doc positions and uh, ended up in ali golipur's lab at boston children's and harvard um where i focused on computational analysis of diffusion weighted imaging um for uh, acquired from the fetuses who were uh, who were live fetuses you know from from the pregnant women so although i have been an engineer um first and you know use these methods from electrical engineering and computer science in my in my line of work so far uh, the application domain has so far been primarily healthcare and uh, yeah so that's how being an engineer i, I got into the area and uh, I really really enjoy working in healthcare cool sounds really cool I, i think one related question that i would have to that is uh... like how did you i mean of course you said you've come from that in engineering background and your your primary skill set is more more towards engineering but if you're working uh, on an analysis project in a particular domain then often times if you lack the understanding of the domain you're likely to make inferences that are not perhaps uh, that, that, that perhaps a domain expert would not make right so right. how how do you how do you how did you overcome those say i mean so to speak shortcomings or did you really try to beef up on the domain side as well that's a very good question so you know it's uh, and i think uh, what what i did sort of changed as i grew in my career early on um, i really used to try to learn even the domain ideas myself but very soon you hit a wall and you realize you know uh, medicine is an expertise by itself <laughs> and you can't just learn it on coursera or wherever it is right so um if you ask a computer very... scientist he will say <laughs> it's just a, it's just a dictionary <laughs> right so uh, yeah yeah not all the answers are found on web md mark so <laughs> <laughs> so um So, so you know one of the advantages of being a dartmouth was that it's a really small uh, community and we we work very closely with our medical school collaborators and at some point you realize you know it's just easier to ask them the questions than try to figure everything out on your own and um, so what i what i realized was uh, it was still very useful and in fact necessary to pick up a working vocabulary so you're able to communicate effectively with your collaborators but you definitely don't need to learn everything by yourself you can't you yeah. can't really right so um i think having the right vocabulary um, you know in, in enables you to be an effective communicator within the team and then that allows you to understand the 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 problem space that you're addressing a uh, bit better then the new word if you did not have that working vocabulary uh, so that's what i started focusing on when i when i read research papers or when i watch lectures you know these you see a recurring theme of keywords that come up often so understand you know just looking those words up uh, and trying to memorize what their meanings is uh, meanings are and so 
that uh, that was helpful and this is what i continued on later uh, during my career so when i moved to boston and and even during my time at inception and g42 um you know for any new domain area that i try to address i do try to you know learn the basics but then stop there and then hopefully find collaborators who are masters of their game and you know work with them to give you one example uh, you know among the resources that i found really useful are uh, the introductory biology course from from mit on coursera um and often times the review papers that uh, that would be helpful for you when you um you know when you bring in when you come into a clinical problem as an engineer um so these are some of the some of the resources that i've used great okay speaking of memorizing from you know, coming from memorizing so take us through a memorable project that uh, has been etched in your memory for a long period of time what what is something uh that makes that project memorable and what were the problems you faced and how mm -hmm. so <clears throat> i think i really thoroughly enjoyed my project work uh, during my during my postdoc uh, and uh, it was a very hard problem the, the the idea is that you have these uh, so you um, you know in neuroscience a lot of the um, a lot of the neuroscientists often rely on what is called an atlas of uh, of, mm -hmm. of a brain it is essentially like a map of the brain right so um it turns out that atlases of fetuses are not very widely available for a lot of reasons um the the image atlases are often computed from these uh, from these images uh, of the of the subjects that are acquired mm -hmm. so on one hand you have these uh, you know human connectome project where you have seven tesla scans of of human mm -hmm. brain which describe the anatomy in exquisite detail um available to make your life easy for computing these atlases right um, and with these higher resolution essentially maps you can start to study the anatomy right and uh, and that tells you a lot uh, about uh, about what the reference is essentially it's 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 trying it, it's it, it's in some ways you know trying to um take image of thousands of people and then trying to figure out what does the average face look like so you can study you can focus on the differences rather than the similarities and often times um, that's a simplified example but it turns out in in uh, in study of uh, human brains it's is often useful to know what the differences are uh, to assess if that change in structure has any impact on the function right and uh, that then dictates uh, you know various abilities that you might possess as a human and so on so anyway so it it turns out that uh, atlases of fetal brains are are really hard to acquire because um, fetuses you know they move a lot and uh, the the mri scanners make a loud noise so so when a pregnant uh, woman you know if if she's lying on the bed because of the noise and just the agitation you know the space is space is different and so um fetuses move a lot right and these uh, mri images take in the order of uh, you know a few minutes to tens of minutes to to be acquired particularly these diffusion weighted scans that that we were interested in and um so that that was that was the problem that that i focused on it was really challenging again because uh, the the motion makes the problem very hard you know there's there's a there's a lot there are a lot of artifacts and uh, the way these uh, 3d mri images are acquired they are acquired slice by slice right so it's it's sort of like you're trying to slice a watermelon right mm -hmm. uh, at uh, equal uh, at equal spacing from above and imagine that instead of the watermelon being steady so i'm i'm you know let's say you're holding the watermelon and i'm slicing it but instead of holding it steady you're just moving it all the time right and so um if i were to try to put together the watermelon by you know stacking the slices one over the other i'll probably not end up with the same shape as i had because of the motion right so mm -hmm. um that's what made it hard and we so you know working with the team there uh, you know we 
came up with algorithms and methods to compensate for that motion and try to reconstruct the anatomical details. Um, and so that was, uh, so that, that ended up being the world's first reference for uh, the diffusion weighted atlas of the fetal brain. And diffusion imaging is really interesting because it allows you to study the, the white matter tracts of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these, these tracts are like wires or threads that run, run through the brain and connect different areas. And any uh, deformities or, uh, you know, any changes from the reference tracts um, can, can then be evaluated for any impact on the function, right? And so... Uh, to be able to even investigate that hypothesis, whether or not someone's uh, abnormal tracts have any impact on their function, you need that reference first. And so, um, you know, developing these motion compensated imaging methods, we ended up being the, the world's first team to produce an atlas of uh, fetal brain in second and third trimester of pregnancy. And as part of the solution, we actually employed both, uh, you know, the classical model-based approaches for registration along with some you know, newer deep learning based approaches uh, for uh, segmentation of the fetal brain to uh, stabilize that registration problem a little bit. And so it ended up being a very satisfying project you know, with, with lots of different complexities and you really had to throw um, you know, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of the computational power at it from both classical and the newer algorithms to, to be able to come up with, uh, with a solution that was satisfying. Cool. Sounds really, really like a lot of work uh, and uh, finally a good solution that you could be satisfied with. Yes, indeed. <laughs> the Atlas is publicly available, um, you know, if, 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 if anyone's interested. <laughs> I think you can share the link with me and uh, I can maybe add it here. If you have it now, you can put it in the chat or maybe later sure. I can add it on the YouTube video as well. Uh, so building the Atlas itself was a challenge you said right because of the continuous motion of the fetus and then you're not able to say reconstruct back to what it originally is supposed to be because you're not able to capture the uh the overall image in its most accurate form so to speak right uh, and and that is essentially a problem of building the right data set if you if you look at mm -hmm. it right you don't have that data set and this is a problem i have seen uh, in the industry especially with healthcare because uh, and, and it happens because uh, especially with, with the diseases and stuff right you don't have uh, data sets easily available and even if they are it's likely to be a more imbalanced uh, version of the population because it's only only a subset of population is infected with a certain disease so my next question is on that line so building ml solutions in healthcare is often challenging because availability of say label data is limited. So what mm -hmm. have you have you have you had these problems and if you had had them, what are some of the ways in which you've been able to tackle them? Right. I think anyone who has worked in healthcare ML has faced these challenges. You're, you're very right, uh, Imad. So in fact, this particular problem is, is very close to my heart. Uh, you know, um, it's something that I've been focusing on for the past three years. Uh, during my time at inception and continue to focus on it at, at uh, G42 because, excuse me, the problem of low data in, in low label data in healthcare is, is, is not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, right. So I've looked at specifically three different uh, ways of uh, addressing this. First, uh, I've looked at, you know, the, the, the problem of, actually generating more labeled data more easily. So one of the projects that I did with uh, with, with an intern at Inception was to look at uh, um, ways to assist an annotator, essentially a radiologist, in, in, in more quickly being able to annotate, you know, the segmentation, um, se more quickly be able to annotate the objects um, in an image, whether it's for segmentation or classification problem. Um, we we developed some methods that instead of uh, instead of a radiologist having to you know annotate at a pixel level uh, where where an object lies, they could uh, they could just uh, you know put in four clicks um, at what what we call the extreme points, 
and uh, from these four clicks we were then able to produce uh, you know a full segmentation of the object that was intended and we we've tried the method on you know different uh, ct and mri images for different organs and it it works fairly well so that was um, that was one of the projects we did our contribution in that uh, particular yeah, line of work was to come up with these uh, uh principles that uh, that allow us to encode what we call uh, a confidence map so we take the four extreme points and then we try to assess okay is it is uh, it if 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 a user uh, you know has given me four extreme points for an object then it is quite likely then that the line connecting the extreme points uh, lies on the object more so than the points that are away from these lines connecting the extreme points and then we came up with some mathematical models to encode uh, the distances from these uh, lines um as as a confidence map and then we use this uh, you know confidence map as a prior um to 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 produce the final full segmentation so that was a way in which we try to accelerate the annotation process itself because if you only have um a limited time to annotate instead of uh, you know producing limited annotations on a few images you you produce these ai assisted annotations on you know lots of different images mm -hmm. um so that that was one way in another project we actually looked at something called active learning which is which is actually a very interesting and very uh very well studied area within within the machine learning in active learning the idea is uh, you have a pool of labeled samples and a pool of unlabeled samples and you try to learn a model um from the labeled samples and then you use this model somehow to try to understand which of the samples from the unlabeled set need to be annotated to uh to come up with a model that's uh, that's you know very that's uh, better than then you then the model you would learn if you were to randomly draw you know some samples from the from the unlabeled set i'll i'll use an analogy to describe this I'm not sure if it's going to be useful but let's say that you know you were you were a trainee chef right and the master chef charges you a fee for each dish that they teach you right and you were on a budget trying to minimize uh, what you spend mm -hmm. uh, while trying to maximize how many new dishes you are able to make right mm -hmm. so let's say that uh, you know you you're trying to learn thai cuisine and uh, one of the dishes you you try you learn from the master is red curry with tofu mm -hmm. right let's say the another one one other dish that you try to learn from the master is green curry with uh, chicken right and let's say for each of these dishes you've already paid 100 dollars per dish okay now would it be useful for you to um, learn green curry with tofu so green curry with tofu is one thing that you learned red curry with chicken is another thing you learned so would it be useful for you to learn red curry with tofu i hope i'm keeping track here um but the idea is this right so if you if you know how to prepare the proteins in in these two different dishes one with green curry flavor and one with red curry flavor you can probably extrapolate that knowledge right and prepare both green curry with tofu and chicken and red curry with tofu yeah. and chicken so these redundancies in your data right uh, or rather um how much are your data elements are, are useful for uh, learning a better model mm -hmm. that's what we try to assess with active learning and so you know having having a model that you learn from uh, the limited initial set mm -hmm. you try to come up with heuristics to draw you know let's call them a more discriminative set of samples from the unlabeled set mm -hmm. uh, to then retrain your initial initial model and the idea is if i'm going to pay a radiologist let's say you know 200 dollars per ct scan for annotating lung cancer uh, nodules in in that ct scan then i better be sending them ct images that that are more conducive for for the learning algorithm that that i'm trying to use to train the model um right and so um 
so that that's what we try to assess using active learning um and we we explored multiple different uh, you know heuristics to draw samples from the unlabeled set uh, you know you can think of one simple heuristic uh, as uh, an uncertainty based model so the idea is if your classifier produces a score between 0 and 1 you try to um, you try to draw the samples for which your model is most confused right yeah. so if you have your model producing a result of 0.5 um or close to the threshold that that you optimize using an oroc or, or uh, something else you you might want to send that for uh, you know annotation but on the other hand um you know you you could be looking at uh, the latent space structure of your mm-hmm. of your data to try to identify which samples are furthest away from the labeled set that uh, you know you know in your latent space and use distance based heuristics mm-hmm. to to draw a set and so we explored a few different approaches uh, you know in that in that line of work and we have a paper in preparation uh, to be to be submitted to a journal and the mm-hmm. draft is already out on archive um so that was you know active learning to to see okay if we have to get annotated which which images make more sense mm-hmm. um and finally the you know the other approaches that we're looking at is semi supervised and self supervised learning models mm-hmm. so you know in in computer vision world there has been this uh, rather impressive progress made in the past 2 3 years where mm-hmm. we're now seeing image net top one accuracy in the order of 90% um compared to you know the 80% or so which was which was uh, i think the top one accuracy maybe a few years ago and so all of this progress has been uh, a lot of this progress has been unlocked with these algorithms called semi supervised or self supervised mm-hmm. learning methods i'll briefly describe them so in semi supervised learning algorithms the idea is that um, uh, you know you have a labeled set you train a model on it and then you produce what we call pseudo labels on the unlabeled set and then you retrain your initial model combining the the label set and the pseudo labels that your model produces and you repeat this a few time you know so this is um and there there is this uh, framework which is called the teacher student training uh, approach where you know the initial model that produces the pseudo label is considered a teacher and uh, the model that learns from both the label set as well as the pseudo labels is called the student Mm-hmm. so by doing this knowledge distillation between teacher and student back and forth you uh, you know try to uh, come up with a model that uh, that is actually better than a model that you would have learned if you were only learning from the labeled set right mm-hmm. in this learning paradigm you have not uh, you have not increased your annotation budget by by any means right you still do not have any labels on the unlabeled set of images um or samples but you still end up with a model that performs much better than the model you would have if you were only learning from the labeled set right and similar approaches have been tried in a learning paradigm called self supervised uh, approaches where you learn uh, you know you learn a proxy task uh, so for example you know on on all of your available images with and without labels you could rotate them by a certain mm-hmm. amount right let's say 90 mm-hmm. degree and then try to predict that rotation mm-hmm. um as a proxy task mm-hmm. and then you repeat this learning process uh, right many times over with many different uh, samples and so you end up with what we call a foundation model right and then mm-hmm. you fine tune this foundation model on your actual task for example mm-hmm. classification on you know a limited label data and so it turns out that you know this this learning paradigm can also work fairly well particularly if you have uh, you know uh, an unlabeled set that that is very large as compared to your initial labeled set mm-hmm. in some studies from google and facebook we've seen um, that they've used an unlabeled set in the order of 300 million or even billion of images um, mm-hmm. as compared to the image net which is around 1 million images right so mm-hmm. um so com- so we are looking at the semi supervised and self supervised learning approaches um 
particularly in our studies with semi supervised learning approaches on chest x ray analysis we we've seen some extremely promising results and uh, we're in the process of uh, you know preparing a manuscript so i, I i'll uh, i'll hope to share a draft with you as soon as it's on, out on archive um mm -hmm. but uh, but the results are really promising to to to, to the point where we are we're, uh, not really seeing any difference between training with 100% labeled data versus training with you know 10% labeled data in these uh, with what we call these strongly regularized semi supervised learning regimes so um so these are the three ways in which uh, you know me and my team have looked at uh, addressing limited data problem first one was how do we accelerate the annotation process second one was mm -hmm. if we were to seek annotations which images and finally uh, if we just could not seek additional annotations you know how do we how do we make use of unlabeled data sets to improve the performance of our models mm -hmm. cool um, but this is you know far from solved problem and we'll we'll we, we have you know lots to accomplish still all right thank you so much for sharing these uh, methods with us I, and i know you like you said this is something that you are like concentrating on so you have a lot more context uh in 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 recent years on this right so uh, i hope uh, the self supervised method is out soon and we get to see what you are already seeing uh sure <laughs> so yeah i mean one one of the things related to this is uh, when i was in my previous company uh we were actually trying to do model evaluation uh, i'm actually talking with respect to uh, the second point you mentioned where you are trying to look at samples which are more uh say not rep representative already in the label data set right so you want to find the more discriminative ones so this is something we were doing in model evaluation as well right so when our model mm -hmm. wasn't performing as well we were trying to look at those cases where it was uh, very uh, deviating from from like uh, the usual failure modes so may may maybe when your predicted probabilities were even lesser than say 0.2 or 0.3 and then trying to figure out what is how is that data set even structured why is it so different from the other decisions that the model is being over like so yeah i think that technique of finding the most discriminant uh, sample could be useful in a lot of uh, different contexts that way right and yeah uh, one one of the things that could happen because of say say the teacher student model could be that if your teacher is initially biased you bias could creep in into your entire system going forward right and then your entire label data set could have issues that you didn't imagine that it would have so sometimes even there's unintentional bias that creeps into data sets uh, if they are not carefully built so have you seen such instances of bias in your data sets and if yes how have you tackled it if not what do you what do you think we can do to ensure that we build more representative data sets of course one tactic you mentioned is looking at discriminative samples but is there anything else that you can uh, tell right so <clears throat> that's a very um, that's a very important question imad bias is something that you know a lot of people who work in healthcare machine learning are, are really trying to 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 address um in my own experience i've i've seen i've seen bias creep in in ways that are really it's it's really uh befuddling to to uh, <laughs> to say the least um among the projects that i can talk about uh, you know we we analyzed the data sets from this large scale healthcare uh, survey that was con that is in fact being conducted in the united states uh since the start of 1998 until now and you know 2020 and and uh, it will continue in the future as well where a lot of participants are being asked to share their uh, their uh, you know um there there is a questionnaire on the on the healthcare um indicators for example you know do you have diabetes or not um you know what's your what's your height weight uh you know what's your race and ethnicity and so on among other questions in the data sets you know there are uh, for for uh, you know some of the participants there are lab measurements available as well 
um and there are other questions for example if you've had uh, you know hepatitis uh, a in the past if you've been infected with hepatitis a in the past or not um and you know and the list goes on so uh, there are questions on diet there are questions on you know lifestyle uh how many times you know do you eat vegetables and fruits uh in a week and so on but we were very interested in in analyzing this data sets to to uh, mm-hmm. for a number of reasons particularly we were looking for indicators of uh, you know future chronic disease uh, incidence diabetes cardiovascular disease and so on um you know one of the so at some point during the analysis of this uh, of this data the um you know a, a manuscript appeared which uh, talked about how it was possible for these authors who trained a, a machine learning model on chest x-ray to um predict the race of the patient looking purely at the x-ray and nothing else mm-hmm. <laughs> right mm-hmm. and that's a problem right i mean it's it's an image and uh, mm-hmm. an x-ray at that you know with with no additional information and and uh, the authors were able to predict the race of the patient by and you know it was a fairly well performing model and they to the authors credit they tried a lot mm-hmm. to uh, you know impair the model from coming to its decisions by changing the resolution um, you know decreasing the amount of details um, if i recall correctly they even went down Uh, as far as to reduce the resolution to 16 cross 16 i remember and reading a twitter the aura was still like 65 uh, 0.65 uh, right and so um so that was very interesting and so we thought okay can we detect the race if we remove the markers of you know race and so on from from the enhanced data set and uh you know oddly enough the answer was yes so looking looking nothing at but the health data coming from these uh, uh, large scale survey participants we were in fact able to identify you know the race and the auroc there was uh, like 86% or or uh, above i mean we're still working on the study so you know our, our uh, preprint doesn't out yet um but, but but you know so this this goes on to tell you that there are many ways in which uh, um you know you may be leaking information um uh, to your model that uh, that you're not uh, really aware of right and so what can you do about it first i think uh, as model developers we have to be aware of the many ways in which uh, you know these biases can creep in mm-hmm. um right and so once you know whenever we analyze a problem one of the first things we do is we we do try to you know explore the distribution of data along many dimensions such as um age gender ethnicity race and so on to see if there's any you know a uh, lack of representation in the data um with respect to a particular dimension and uh, you know there are ways in which you can uh, compensate for it somewhat i mean you know you 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 know, I think a lot of us are very well familiar with class imbalance uh, yeah. dealing with class imbalance in these data sets and so you can try to address it mm-hmm. um to to some extent lastly uh, you know once um, once a model is trained instead of looking at you know an aggregate overall metric such as accuracy we actually try to look at uh, you know the performance metrics along these multiple dimensions through which bias can un- unintentionally creep in Mm-hmm. and uh yeah so this is this is an area of, you know we, we we are we are continuing to focus on you know learning as we go along to 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 ensure that we reducing the bias in in the models that we train yeah i think one uh, use case i mean one news that had come out was uh i think google image search was showing uh right yeah certain results that it shouldn't be showing because of the bias in their training data set uh but yeah i mean it's it's an ongoing process i suppose as as you discover uh, more and more dimensions along which you could have had bias and then you try to fix those particularly in healthcare it's important because you know on one hand you have turing award winners like joffrey hinton claiming that you know radiologists should be worried for their jobs Yeah. on the other hand you have ground realities of uh, that that make healthcare an extremely hard problem to work on and 
fair disclaimer you know i mean i'm a big fan of joffrey hinton but uh, it goes on to show you that uh, you know healthcare is uh, is not as easy that uh, you know a lot of people actually think and so the least you can do do is be humble about the models you train you know be aware of the potential shortcomings and uh, be prepared to you know address the shortcomings absolutely um and i think one question on that related note right so when 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 you're trying to improve the performance of your model uh w- what are some of the data pre processing techniques uh, that you've seen uh that have proven to work for you uh, maybe you can share a few sure so you know i think uh, andrew ang recently had a talk where he described from moving to model centric to data centric ai right and so i think a lot of people are now beginning to not a lot of people i think most people out there have, have by now realized that um this this uh, you know developing machine learning models is so much about the data itself and so um you know in uh, well, among the few things we do is first we you know just manually and uh, you know visually look at the data sets right whether they be from imaging from structured data sets or uh text or whatever it is we you know sit down actually look at the data set try to understand what are the different dimensions in the data set um you know um so getting getting familiar with the data set is extremely important because you you sometimes you know come across things that uh, that uh, that are a short i mean let's say a problem with the data set that you wouldn't really find otherwise if you, if you were not looking i think jeremy howard to his credit in fast.ai course actually presents an example where i think was it the cars data set where he finds examples where the model uh, does not perform well mm-hmm. where which uh, which were actually not even cars I'm sorry it was probably cats and dogs data set where i know, don't remember yeah either way so uh, there, there are these uh, you know so what what he described was this uh, data set actually claimed to have cats and dogs but there were uh, some images which were neither right uh, where, where the model actually uh, did not perform well so you know so it's uh, manual exploration is, is really important so you can find these edge cases uh, and take care of them um among other things that we do is we look for ways to um you know make train our model in, in you know to to make it more robust towards the many forms of variations that can occur in a data set in a medical imaging data set you know for example uh, applying augmentation techniques such as rotation translation shear um uh, zoom in zoom out you know changing the resolution uh, a bit uh, among others and uh, yeah and among other things that we do is actually you know this is this is also a suggestion that andre carpathy talks about on his on his blog is that actually look at the data as it you know goes through the different uh, input stages right up until the point you know where it's mm-hmm. uh, taken into the model mm-hmm. and believe it or not it has actually helped us many times you know in in mm-hmm. in in our uh, real world applications where we've where you start with you know reasonable assumptions for example okay i'll, I'll introduce xyz gaussian blur right and and then mm-hmm. you end up finding that okay the object that i'm trying to detect is probably lost by this extent of blur mm-hmm. so i should probably tone it down a bit right mm-hmm. um and uh, you know so these are among the techniques that we that we've used um in general you know we we look at regularizing the model training chain all throughout so you have the data part the model part the metric part and so you we use several regularization uh, uh, techniques uh-huh. on the data model and metric to ensure that we have a model that is well regularized and that uh, you know does not learn these shortcuts All right. Thanks for sharing those with us and uh, I think we have time for one last question and then we can open uh, the forum for audience questions if there are any. Sure. Uh so I think this is a, going to be a bit more generic sort of a question uh, on because there are a lot of people out there who are looking to get in the field and they've been like uh 
spoiled for resources, so to speak. <laughs> so they they always have these questions around what resources to focus on and all of that. So I would maybe just put it uh, as simple as uh, one line. So what are the skill sets required to succeed and grow uh, in, say, the data science, machine learning, AI industry? And I mean, if you have a few resources that you would like to share, you can go ahead. Sure. Um... I think uh, I think one has to be comfortable with programming. So you should at least be, you know, comfortable uh, writing codes in Python. You know, that's that's sort of become the language of choice uh, for for most uh, ML practitioners. Um, you should also be able to understand the code written by others. And this is where, if you have an intermediate to somewhat advanced level of exposure to python you can you can really thrive because you know as you said ima there are so many resources there are so many code bases available on github where you can which you can you know take a look at and learn from it does require you to understand you know uh, good python programming practices um, knowing how to write a class and uh, you know some of the python disc decorators what are decorators in python and uh, so, so knowing intermediate to advanced level of Python is extremely helpful. Um, there are many Python uh, programming courses available on Coursera where one could start, but it is one of those things where you know you learn with practice. So, I can't recall a resource off the top of my head because I learned Python many years ago. But uh, um, you know, any new in the field, any new person in the field has to make sure you know they're they're spending time in writing code um, no, and not only reading about it. Um, you also have to understand basics of uh, the, the math involved. I think uh, having high school level of exposure to topics from calculus, linear algebra, and probability would be a, would be a good start. But there are a number of resources right, that, uh, that one could refresh, uh, use to refresh their uh, knowledge um, I think the introduction introduction to statistical learning book by mm -hmm. um, Daniela Witten, Tipshirani, and others is is a is a is a great resource. Uh, that book actually uses R to write their examples, but uh, you know you can find others. And um, by no means an in, an introductory book. Um, and no one should be disappointed if they find it difficult to read. But an absolute favorite is uh, is uh, Murphy's book on machine learning. I was, mm -hmm. I was looking up because it's on my shelf right here. And so, um, you know, it's uh, it's very comprehensive. It talks about uh, uh, probabilistic um, approaches in machine learning and, and uh, Covers many varieties of topics that uh, would be of interest to someone who's uh, you know familiar with the basics of machine learning. Okay, so what is your one-line statement for someone who wants to just enter the field? Um, start by doing it. I think Jeremy Howard's approach should work well for a lot of people who are new to the area and are probably intimidated by the amount of work that needs to be done to you know to, to get to the point where you can start producing result but, and uh, definitely don't uh, you know don't let people uh, scare you into believing you that you can't really do it if you don't be a master in math first or a master in advanced python first i think you can learn a lot as you go along you and you know it's a marathon not a sprint so you just you just have to have the dedication and stay focused all right. Yeah, sounds good. Then, I know it's very cliched, but uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's what I really think. No, it is what it is. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about putting in the hours, I suppose, and then uh, right. and then keep being at it all the time, and then you will see that. It's, I mean, it's again, like I said, it's cliched, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it is what it is. Okay, I think the, yeah. with that, I come to an end of uh, to the list of the questions that I had, but we can also take a look at the Q&A section and uh, see if there's a few questions I can already see. So I've brought one question on stage. Uh, I think Dr. Valley, I don't know who Dr. Valley is, but Dr. Valley asks a question. Does your company incorporate the use of federated learning in healthcare? Uh, we are familiar with federated learning approaches. We haven't. Um, 
we haven't had a use for it just yet because a lot of the data sets that we work with come from our local collaborators where you know, we're, we're able to provide them with a secure uh, UAE based cloud computing facility to, to be able to work with their data sets. Nevertheless, you know, um, we are familiar with federated learning approaches uh, on how to how to implement it and how to uh, execute it. Um, so we'd be able to do it if, if there ever was was a need. Okay, I hope that is answered. And okay. on that point, anyone interested in federated learning should really check out a recent paper coming from NVIDIA and Boston Medical Group cluster. It's on how they implemented federated learning to learn from you know more than 20 participating sites spread all across the globe. Um, and the results are obviously very, very interesting to see that, you know, with the combined data sets from these multiple sites, the, the performance of the model was actually better than what it would be if it was learned from, you know, site specific data. Uh, one of my dear friends, Zana Zanul Abedin, was a co-author on that paper, and he has a very good write-up on LinkedIn about uh, another study, which I encourage everyone to check out. Okay, let's get to the next question. Any ML use cases used for tabular data? Example, patient level analysis or HCP level analysis? I think... Um, assuming HCP is healthcare provider... Healthcare um, professional. Healthcare professional, okay. Um, so yes, I mean there are uh, there are many you know, the still the analysis of healthcare survey data from NHANES that I talked about. That's you know we used a fair number of uh, tabular data analysis approaches such as random forest gradient boosting machines and so on. Um, you know in our uh, projects on analysis of healthcare claims, uh, healthcare finance data sets. Healthcare operations data sets. We do explore, uh, you know, the tab. We do so address these problems as tabular data problems, and we look at, uh, you know, both classical and modern machine learning algorithms to to address them. Uh, it's really hard to beat gradient boosting machines. Is 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 uh, if if you tune it well, is is what I found. But there are, uh, you know, approaches such as tab transformers and others which have looked at applying. Um, deep learning tabular data sets that uh, I encourage everyone to check out. I think one related question to that is when you use, say, gradient boosting machines or random forests, uh, do you also try and look at their feature importances uh, to figure out, and and what, what do you do in general to figure out feature importances when you use, say, uh, ensemble data? We definitely do use uh, feature importance methods. You know, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, these are all, uh, I mean, a lot of the approaches that we have used in particular are all, you know, retrospective post hoc analysis techniques, such as looking at the SHAP values. And it can, it can give you a pretty good idea of what the model is using um, to, to make its decision among, you know, among the variety of features, which ones are more important. Um, but there are several limitations um, as well that one has to be aware of of uh, when and when not to trust what you see um, as an important feature. The short answer is yes, we do use you know um, SHAP, Lime, and other approaches to to, yeah. to see what's what the model is thinking are important features. No, thanks for bringing the limitations point because I made a video on that just last week on YouTube. So go check that out if you want. Absolutely, to I will. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, not to you, but in, in general to everyone. So, no, 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 it's, uh, yeah. it's always good so, to learn new things. So there, was, there was a paper uh, on general pitfalls on uh, using model agnostic machine learning, interpretable machine learning technique, which is again, SHAP, Lime, and all of these techniques. Uh, Christoph Molnar, who has written the interpretable machine learning book, is like the lead author of this paper. So what I essentially did was try to summarize what he has done in the paper. So yeah, I have that video on YouTube. I mean, I'm just bringing it up because it came up. No, absolutely. Uh, I'd yeah. love to check it out because I really like his book. Uh, yeah. You know, we use it. Um, We've read chapters from it. We we you know we recommend it to all of our uh, you know team members, new interns, and so on. 
so i'd love I to mean, check out your video I, ideally i mean i mean for, maybe for you you could directly read the paper it's i mean you don't need to check my summary of the paper but okay so that's all right sure <laughs> so how am okay the next question is from case one uh, how ml or dl techniques are leveraged in computational neuroscience any use cases in brain comp sure in computational neuroscience you could be um <clears throat> using the ml or dl techniques to analyze uh, you know the connections between different parts of the brain so as an example it turns out you can use the uh, you can represent a brain's connectome uh, as a graph right and so once you have uh, once you have converted essentially this this you know diffusion tracts that describe how what is the strength of connections um, and i'm simplifying things here a bit so in a neuroscientist don't take offense but um, you know once you once you quantify what is the strength of these uh, connections between different uh, areas of the brain you can formulate that as a graph and once you have a graph essentially representing the connections of an individual brain uh, you can then you know go on and apply any number of graph machine learning or deep learning techniques to uh, for 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 variety of reasons right so one one approach again could be to uh, try to identify which are the which are which uh, which is let's say a model graph representing uh, you know what ideally the connections within the brain should look like and then what would with re with reference to this model graph what would uh, what would constitute a, constitute an abnormality right and what would be the impact of it among other applications um, uh you could be using it to study the spike train uh that is that is generated from the neurons um and that also relates to the brain computer interfaces right so if anyone who has seen neuralink's uh demonstration of how they use these signals acquired from uh opix brain to um uh, you know for uh, for these creating these brain machine uh, interfaces um a lot of the interpretation there um i presume is using some sort of machine learning or deep learning though i don't think they've made publicly they publicly disclosed what algorithms were used okay we have time for one last question if there is any question please uh, drop them in the q and a we just have a minute so if you drop it now it will be taken up or else maybe i think shadab can uh, take it later you can also contact him perhaps on linkedin shadab sure. that's okay okay then i think there's no question that i can see so thank you so much shadab for this chat with us it was really great having you uh, on on sure, the, yeah it was really great having you today for for the session uh, if you have any few few last words that you would like to share uh, this is the time i just like to you know say again that uh, you know you know when you enter the data science or machine learning field a lot of things are very intimidating right and uh, words like eigen vector and eigen analysis you know uh tormented me for a very long time to be honest um it's it's important not to lose sight of the bigger picture and often you know you as, as long as you are uh, determined and you keep coming back to you know the concepts that you learn and uh, you're open minded about the the pos the possibilities and limitations of the algorithm i think uh, i think you can go really uh, far and long in in data science as a professional okay uh, all right then thank you so much everyone for joining uh, i hope it was a good use of your time as well and i will see you next month with yet another speaker or webinar or fireside chat whatever it is we we'll, i will see you next month until then have a good time and yeah stay safe wherever you are thank you so much bye all right thank you imad it was a pleasure talking to you